Hi there. My name is Scott Santens. Thank you for having me here today. And uh, I'm going to be talking about the idea of an unconditional basic income, otherwise known as universal basic income or just basic income or UBI. And uh, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about the crypto UBI projects that are um, doing crypto UBI. So first of all, just to clarify what basic income is, it is an unconditional, universal, individual, periodic amount of money or currency. So this means there's no work requirements, uh, it goes to people regardless of work, and um, it goes to people regardless of how much money that they're earning, be it rich or poor. And uh, individual means it goes to each and every person instead of for the household. And periodic, as in it's a regular recurring amount of money, be it weekly, monthly, daily, quarterly, even annually, um, just so you really expect it to come, you know when it's going to come next. So a little bit of the history of UBI. Uh, you can go back as far as Thomas More, and he said, the no penalty on earth will stop people from stealing if it is their only way of getting food. It would be far more to the point to provide everyone with some means of livelihood. So this is the logic behind basic income, not so much the actual proposal. Then some more logic behind basic income and something much closer to the proposal was by Thomas Paine in 1796, when he proposed that everyone would receive an amount of capital upon reaching adulthood. Poverty is a thing created by that which is called civilized life. It exists not in the natural state. It is a position not to be controverted that the earth in its natural uncultivated state was and ever would have continued to be the common property of the human race. In that state, every man would have been born to property. So Thomas Paine saw it as this kind of natural inheritance. And Thomas Spence also in 1796, he was, as far as we know, the first one to actually propose a fully universal amount of regular money in the form of, uh, essentially it was a land value dividend. The land with all that appertains to it is in every parish made the property of the corporation or parish. The rent on this land should be used to cover various public expenditures, and what is left is about one to two thirds should be divided equally among the whole number of souls, male and female, married and single in a parish, from the infant of a day old to the second infantage of hoary hairs. I like the addition of the hoary hairs there personally, kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, this was the first uh, UBI. Then a couple hundred years later, uh, this was kind of the origins of uh, Nixon's guaranteed income for families. And I, th this quote, I think, is especially important both then and now in that it really speaks to the importance of meeting basic needs. Look, we're in a situation approaching anarchy. The confidence and trust in institutions, the necessary institutions holding together a society, is dwindling, drying up. Liberals and conservatives have to come together to try to address people's real needs. Otherwise, the society is going to collapse. The social contract will go and we won't have enough respect for institutions to keep going. I think this is especially poignant then and also now. So just a little bit of uh, what how things have been going without a basic income uh, for the last decades, and this is true not just in the U.S., but uh, around the world. This idea that, uh, that you could actually not require a college degree, and there could be a single earner household, and you could live the American dream, you can, or in other countries, receive like a median income. This has been disappearing over time. Um, it's not that that uh, that you lose your job and you can't find anything else, uh, but you do lose your job due to automation and offshoring, and um, you may or may not find one. You may find a better job, or you may find a job that pays less and doesn't have as much security, doesn't have as much stability. So for these people that are finding new jobs after losing the previous ones and they pay less and they have less stability, less benefits, um, these people are getting angrier. And then you see that experts will say, oh, no, there's the, you know, automation always creates better jobs. Everyone's always better off. Globalization makes stuff cheaper. It's all good. And 
when you are that person and you have personally seen your life over the past decades get a little bit worse and um, you are more likely to lose faith in institutions when when you are treated that way. Um, meanwhile, in Alaska, they started up a basic income in 1982 in the form of their Alaska dividend, which is a, an annual universal amount of money. And so what has been happening there? Well, there was no loss in full-time employment as a result of this amount of money that can average about a thousand two thousand dollars a year and that's for everyone in a household so that can be you know for a family of five ten thousand uh, dollars part-time work has actually increased by 17 percent and babies have been born healthier and uh, due to better maternal nutrition that can lead to adults with higher incomes and better health um, Crime actually goes down, uh, property crime at least, uh, temporarily after the dividend goes out. And for people who are worried about inflation, uh, the inflation growth measured by the CPI in Alaska compared to the U.S. was growing at a faster rate pre-1982 when the dividend started. And after 1982, uh, when it grew at a slower rate. So... That's an interesting outcome for those who, who believe that it would absolutely cause inflation. It has not in, in Alaska. And uh, also, every year when the dividend goes out, there are sales as um, stores compete for those dollars. So the main thing I feel that the people are always worried about basic income is, oh, people are start working. Well, so we already know a lot about this. Um, this is a meta-analysis from dozens of studies and um, here's a quote from the, uh, from the meta-analysis. Despite a detailed search, we have not found any evidence of a significant reduction in labor supply. Instead, we found evidence that labor supply increases globally among adults, men and women, young and old, and the existence of some insignificant and functional reductions to the system, such as a decrease in workers from the following categories. Children, the elderly, the sick, those with disabilities, women with young children to look after, or young people who continue studying. These reductions do not reduce overall supply because it is largely offset by increased supply from other members of the community. We can see this also in the most recent uh, city pilots. Uh, a couple of results have come out so far in, uh, in the U.S. And Stockton provided $500 a month um, for a couple of years. And the results were that pre um, trial pre-experiment 28 um, percent were full-time employed and recipients um, were 40 percent full-time employed afterwards after a year and in the control group uh, pre-experiment is 32 percent full-time employed post-experiment 37 percent employed so you can see that it really helped people find um, full-time employment from either unemployment or part-time employment or gig work. In Hudson, New York, it was actually very similar. $500 a month basic income and employment doubled, going from 29% to 63%. So it is just not factual that people, you know, stop working. So there's a lot we know about basic income already. Here's actually a list I've com compiled of um, some of the things. And if you look into each of these, you'll find evidence um, that are applicable to this discussion. And uh, I've actually summarized all of these here. And um, so some of these have uh, are from multiple experiments. And here's just a, a quick rundown of these. Uh, again, there's no significant reduction in labor supply. That's a meta-analysis. Uh, increased self-employment by 301%. That was in Namibia and uh, the part-time employment in Alaska. Um, the self-employment finding is actually, we say that a, a lot. Uh, we frequently see people use their basic incomes to start up their own businesses uh, to self-employ, and it actually works much better than, let's say, uh, a loan situation, because not only do the uh, would-be entrepreneurs get access to capital, uh, but they also get access to customers thanks to all the people around them also getting money to spend as customers. 
Another people, uh, another thing people are worried about commonly is that drug use will increase, uh, but a meta-analysis has been done with that, again, with dozens of studies, and it shows that actually there's a slight decrease in alcohol and tobacco use. Um, new mothers tend to uh, use basic income as maternity leave. Uh, again, birth weights improve due to better nutrition. Uh, graduation rates and educational outcomes improve. Hospitalization rates decline. Crime goes down. Domestic violence decreases. Trust increases. Homeownership rates increase. That's interesting for those worried about rent. Uh, if a lot more people decide to become homeowners instead of renters, that should actually uh, reduce pressure on rent. And when it goes to crime and, hus um, and better health, then we should see that also from um, consider the savings involved in that uh, as well. Uh, homeownership rates, again, uh, they increase food insecurity. Uh, food security increases. Uh, people often actually improve their diets. They get more fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, that's been seen across studies. Uh, there's improved cognitive functioning and uh, personality traits improve, uh, especially for kids. And savings go up and debts go down. Here's a joke that uh, I feel this summarizes um, why unconditional, why universal, is that before studying engineering, if someone asked me what one plus one is, I would have said two. Now I'd say I'm pretty sure it's two, but we'd better make it three just to be safe. And uh, I think that's uh, an important way of looking at this because when it comes to traditional means of assistance, it's always after the fact and then you have to jump through hoops and you may or may not get it. Uh, but of course, the best way to actually get assistance is for the assistance to already be there, that it's just this segment is like a second engine on a plane, it's always there. And so if you happen to lose your primary source of income, then you still have basic income. But if you don't have basic income and for some reason you lose your primary source of income, then you could be without an engine and uh, that's when crashes happen. So yeah, there's a big difference between someone getting help they don't need and someone needing help they don't get. The former can, consider, can be considered wasteful, but the latter can prove fatal. It's always better to get and not need than need and not get. So this is, I think it's important for, for the importance of universality to be understood that you really want to make sure that you don't make the error of excluding the people who you really want to include. And, you know, so people are worried about, oh, the rich will get it. And if it's it's wasteful, if the rich get it, but if the if someone in really desperate need doesn't get it, then that could be fatal. So that's one of the reasons why it's important um, for, for full universality to be part of this. And again, this is uh, also goes into to importance of universality. Um, this is a, a description of, of our welfare programs here in the US, um, but this is actually pretty much the case uh, uh, for everywhere. Anytime you have a targeted program, you're gonna be excluding people. So our food assistance program excludes one out of three people who need it. Uh, our cash assistance program for families excludes four out of five people who need it. It actually varies by state. So it's actually excludes 94 people out of 100 people who need it um, in, in some states like Louisiana and um, excludes four to five people with disability, excludes three out of four people who are unemployed. UBI, however, reaches everybody. So it's just, you gotta have, it's not that it should be the only thing, but by having that floor, then you make sure that no one of the extra um, falls to the very, very bottom. Um, so here I just wanna go over some crypto uh, approaches that are going on right now. And there's, I'm just gonna cover six, there's more than six, uh, but these are some just interesting different approaches. So I think maybe the best known right now is uh, Proof of Humanities, UBI. And uh, per uh, coin, it's actually the one with the most value. Um, it accrues at one per hour and it's a verified list of humans. Um, you go through a process. Um, there's even like a court system uh, to make sure that you're able to prove this with a video and a photo and um, you hold up like your wallet address 
in during this and you attest that you're human to create this Sybil proof list of humans. Um, it's being updated soon. So it, right now it's a constant stream, uh, but there's actually going to be added ability to split the stream. So let's say you could um, split some of your basic income somewhere else, donate it to another person, to another group. Um, you donate, donate it back, you can burn it. And uh, the, the, the UBI burns thinks that's interesting, a bunch of, that there's an increasing number of programs. Um, as the community grows, there's different ways to actually burn UBI to, um, to increase the value. So there's, um, you know, NFT mechanisms. Uh, there's a, um, a betting protocol where part of the revenue goes. You can put your, uh, to put various currencies in like Ethereum in a vault. And then part of the interest goes to burn basic income. Um, so this is is a uh, is one of the the bigger approaches. There's already fifteen thousand humans approved uh, so far, and uh, it's actually been uh, gotten support from Vitalik is actually bought and burned and also buying and holding uh, basic income as well. Uh, then Mana is actually the first. Uh, crypto UBI, it's been relaunched recently, and now it's uh, using Bright ID to verify humans using Bit2 verification. You get one per coin per day, and um, you can claim it uh, every day, and um, up to a week you can not claim it, and then you can claim like a week's worth, but if you don't claim for a week, then you know you can't just keep... Um, accruing that you have to actually claim it once a week if you wait a week. Good dollar is another project. Um, the amount varies. So, you know, one day you'll get say 40, another day you'll get 60, another 80, it depends on who's who's collecting, um, who's claiming it that day. You have to claim this one every day um, right now. That could change in the future. So there's 41,000 active claimers. It's distributed $289,000, and there's 1.2 million staked right now. Impact Market uh, provides stable dollars, and this is a, a bit different in that it's not necessarily a UBI, but it can be UBI. So let's say one person in a village can be chosen as a distributor. That person can determine who in the village um, should receive this or is going to receive this and depending on how much they provide and how long it is then the amount that they're provided can you know however last that long so it could be targeted or it could be universal it depends and uh, this one is distributed over 2.9 million and there's over 46,000 claimers circles has been around for a while too this is more of a personal currency approach. Anyone can start their own. Um, you require being trusted by three other people. You get one per hour. And there's a lot more connections with um, co-ops. And it, it's, it, it could even be like discounts. So let's say you go to a coffee shop that accepts circles. And instead of your coffee being you know, $5 and your coffee would be say $3 and then you use some circles too. Um, it's a lot more of this this kind of a community um, co-op approach. Intercoin is also kind of like that as well, where it, it's more about the community itself. So a community can determine its own currency. Uh, let's say so a, uh, a city can do this. And by creating its own currency, it would be backed uh, by Intercoin. And they're hoping to do some uh, pilots in the U.S., at some point too, just like Circles is looking to do the pilot in Berlin. Um, I think this, uh, these approaches are also very interesting from um, you know, kind of a community currency approach. So uh, just to finish up, uh, just say that to me, basic income really is about this message that we are all equally worthy of existing, that this is a, a human right to currency and that we should see this as Maslow's hierarchy of needs where covering the absolute most basic needs um, actually lifts people up and they're more able to join their communities, they're more able to participate, they're more able to self-actualize. Um, 
it's not that they just sit there doing nothing once you have your most basic needs met. Everyone wants to to reach those higher levels, and basic income just makes that more possible. So thank you. Uh, you can go to my website, scottsantons.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at Scott Santons, and uh, you can also read my book, uh, Let There Be Money. Thank you so much.